So I think uh, for the sake of getting started, um, I would just like to welcome everyone really quickly. My name is Josh Lubin Levy. I'm a part time lecturer in visual studies at Eugene Lang, the new school. And I'm also the current editor in chief of the Movement Research Performance Journal with Mayfield Brooks. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's event with Yvonne Rayner, organized with Rachel Cherner. In a moment, I'll turn it over to Rachel to introduce the evening's program. But before I do, I want to mention that the program will last somewhere around an hour, maybe a little bit longer, with opportunities for questions. So if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to enter them into the chat that's running alongside the video. I also want to say a special thank you to The Kitchen and particularly to Matthew Lyons for co-producing this event with us. And at the New School to thank Neil Greenberg, So Young Yoon, and Rafael Munoz for their incredible work putting the virtual bodies programs together, as well as Mark and Dorian, who are really behind the scenes making all of this happen. We're all very glad to be here with Rachel, Yvonne, and Apollo, especially on this anxiety-filled evening on the precipice of what I know many of us hope will be the beginning of the end of something. And I personally hope tonight gives you a chance to tune out, but also to tune in to the importance of continuing to make space, not only for performance, but for the exercise of being together in the hum of our collective rage, grief, hope, and pessimism. As an opening up, as we host this program online to the new school, we acknowledge that we are now occupying a space that rests and operates within what is at least for some an unceded territory, that this place has always been as Lenape Hoking or Manhattan, among others, part of a network of intersecting indigenous movements and in the ongoing struggle for indigenous liberation. We ask you to join in acknowledging indigenous communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. Especially as we tune in virtually, we recognize this program takes place, takes place from, takes the place of space while searching for solidarity with all indigenous peoples here and beyond, whose land was stolen to create settler states and who continued to live under siege, surveillance, and colonial structural violence on their own occupied lands and waters. This acknowledgement should not function as acceptance or closure, but as a call, a call in, to commit to work to reconfigure our notions about ourselves and to take on the responsibility in the face of possibility to dismantle the ongoing effects of settler colonialism. With many thanks to Jackson Paulus and Jay May Barizo for working with us on this text, and now with this call in place, it's my pleasure to turn the virtual room over to Rachel Cherner, who is a part-time lecturer in the visual studies program at the New School and co-founder of the imprint No Place Press. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Rachel Cherner. Um, I'm so pleased to be here tonight, at least virtually, uh, with Yvonne Rayner. We're here to celebrate Yvonne's new book, Revisions, published by No Place Press, and to come together on, as Joshua said, this anxiety-filled, although it's sort of far more than that, um, more than merely anxiety filled on the somewhat uh, terrifying eve of the election for a visit by Apollo Musaghete, a straight talking God and Rainer alter ego. And while Yvonne's prose and delivery may give us a moment's reprieve, even as she plunges us headfirst into darkness, it also reminds us with force and deadpan humor of the seriousness of where we are as a country and of the significance of tomorrow's vote and the votes that have already been cast. I am grateful that she is with us tonight. An artist as esteemed as Yvonne Rayner needs little introduction, but I would be remiss if I didn't give a few details from her incredible career. And so in a highly condensed version, a bio. Dancer, choreographer, filmmaker, and writer Yvonne Rayner has been hailed as one of the most influential artists of the last half century. As a leading figure in the Judson dance theater movement, Rayner rose to prominence in the 1960s as a proponent and theorist of minimalism in dance. She left choreography in the early 1970s to become a filmmaker whose work melded feminist critique with the techniques of the avant-garde. Over the next 25 years, Rayner wrote and directed experimental feature films that grappled with issues of privilege, aging, inequality, and postmodernism. In 2000, she returned to dance and choreography in a series of works commissioned by the Baryshnikov Dance Foundation, the Performa Biennial, and the Museum of Modern Art. Her most recent dance, Remembering and Disremembering Trio A, with excerpts from Peter Sheldahl's 77 Sunset Me, 
was performed in February 2020. Yvonne has long investigated the ways in which movement can be understood as a political act in and of itself, on the stage, on the screen, and at the lectern. In her new book, she pushes this conception of embodied activism to a new arena, what she calls the dance rant. Initially conceived as a performance piece that evolved in live presentations between 2017 and 2019 in Dublin, Stockholm, and New York, Yvonne's rant, subtitled A Truncated History of the Universe for Dummies, has been expanded and adapted in written form in revisions. The book also includes other texts by Yvonne, an introduction by Greg Bordowitz, an interview with Douglas Crimp, an essay by Anna Stenozenko, and notes by Anna Marie Coates. Together, these pieces ask, at a time when the need to refresh our screens for new and newer content feels ever more compelling, what does it mean to return to something, including an earlier self, and to revise, to rewrite, to rethink? And what are the political implications of such speculative acts? Yvonne's lecture to humanity does not do so from some imagined calm afforded us by time, but from rage and sadness and disbelief within a given moment, this moment. And it includes all the messy corrections and postscripts such a space requires. I wanna thank Matthew Lyons in the kitchen, as well as Joshua Leuven levy and the New School for supporting tonight's event. And I wanna direct you to at No Place Press on Instagram for more info about the book and for a very special edition that will be announced later this week. And here I can show you the book itself. A note about tonight's format. Yvonne will read from revisions um, and then she and I will open it up to your questions. So please feel free to submit those questions through the chat. And with that, I am delighted to give the floor to Yvonne Rayner and very grateful that she is here tonight. Rachel, thank you for that. Um, yes, uh, uh, I guess a way to describe what I'm going to read. Uh, in short, it is about rage and sadness and disbelief at this moment in our uh, strange uh, history current history in this country. Um, but I, I want to express my gratitude to No Place Press, everyone involved in it, uh, uh, for their enthusiasm and not only publishing this book that I'm going to read from, but a uh, compendium. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, it's uh, revisions number two. I couldn't stop writing after this came out. So I'm going to read a little bit from the, uh, the pamphlet that followed this. So here goes. September 23rd, 2017. To whom it may concern. My name is Apollo Musaget, leader of the muses, god of the sun. Just so you won't worry about who's minding the store up there while I'm away, let me reassure you that Calliope and Melpomene have taken over my job of guiding a sun chariot across the heavens every day. The truth of the matter is that I came down to earth this time around for a well-deserved vacation, but also at the invitation of choreographer Emily Coates, who was about to present her work about Balanchine and his ballet Apollo in New York City. She asked me to play myself rather than Yvonne Rayner in the piece. It was an offer I couldn't refuse. Emily must have heard of a performance of mine that took place some 50 years ago at Judson Memorial Church at a time when I was trying my hand at choreography. I had invited Isaac Newton to be my partner in an erotic duet during which 50 red rubber balls were to be thrown down one at a time from the choir loft of the church. He declined. He objected to my choice of 50 rubber balls rather than a single Gravenstein apple, but also said I was too old for him. I had to admit that I'd been around quite a bit longer than he had. Anyway, Emily's dance received a good review in the New York Times. Uh, by the way, mine didn't. 
So you see, your earth is not an entirely unfamiliar place to me. There was another performance that Emily may have attended years ago titled 40 Paxton Rayner Read Their Writings. Be aware this time I was embodying Yvonne Rayner who is a little hard of hearing and sometimes slow on the uptake as you shall soon see. The three of us read from our writings in 10 minute increments three times. On his third turn, Paxton forgot to give a signal at the end for the projection of a film of a very peculiar and colorful spider. So when his light faded as he made his exit and my light came up, there was a confusion as to what had happened. I just assumed that he had decided not to show the film. But when I saw Forty get up from her position and go over to talk to him, I left mine to ask her what was happening. And I thought she said, he forgot to bring the film. I then returned to my position and started to read. But when I had finished, I began to seethe. Why hadn't he told us before the show? Why didn't I figure out that he had simply forgotten to give the cue for the projection? No. I continued to be pissed. But then lo and behold, the spider film was projected. I said to myself, what the fuck? And went over to Steve and said as much. Of course, he didn't understand why I was so upset. During the bows, I still embodying Yvonne Rayner punched Steve in the shoulder to which he responded, fuck you. And I replied, fuck you too. I wonder if during the applause, any spectators were able to lip read that exchange. I must confess that from my Apollonial, Apollonian perspective, I still don't see why I should be held accountable for Miss Rayner's dim-wittedness. I really do miss dancing, however. I've been thinking of a solo. I even have a title swan song and last hurrah. It has lots of swearing and complaining about the state of your world and the lousy shape it's and I am in, but I guess it will have to wait. At this point, before immersing you in a more expanded account of my earthly escapades. And at the risk of taxing your patience, I must describe a recent mundane, though traumatic event that took place almost as soon as I arrived in order to dispel any further illusions you may have of me as an invulnerable superior being. From past experience, I should have known that a god does not impersonate a human being without a certain amount of risk, and that my hasty embodiment of Yvonne Rayner this time around may have been ill-advised. In hindsight, I would have fared better if I had given myself more time to look around, but I did digress. So that I might prepare myself for at least one of the ways in which middle class mortals in industrialized countries conduct their lives, I visited a northern Manhattan gymnasium with the intention of spending half an hour on a recumbent bicycle. Because someone was already occupying that machine, I decided to try the treadmill. So there I was. Treading, trudging along at a fairly brisk pace, when for some unfathomable reason, I pushed a button that caused the damn thing to instantly take off at 50 miles an hour, catapulting my feet behind and landing me flat on my back on the floor in shock and at a loss as to what had happened. The end result was deep abrasions on both legs. I have the scars to prove it and considerable humiliation with, witnessed by fortunately only one other person who happened to be in the room. On top of the above pratfall, the front doorknob where I was staying fell off. One of Yvonne Rayner's hearing aids along with her reduced fare MTA card bit the dust and the apartment became infested with bed bugs. 
The following week, I moved out and did a lot of lying around in another friend's digs, feeling sorry for myself while watching sitcoms and appalling international news reports and wolfing down shitloads of comfort food and wondering if these experiences were typical of life on Earth in the postmodern era. Mm. I, I think I need to uh, interject here. It may be confusing that the text is in the voice of Apollo, but I, Yvonne Rayner, am reading it and Apollo occasionally impersonates someone called Yvonne Rayner. So if you'll bear with me, uh, I'll skip around a little bit here. Um, Mm. I cherish a, an unexpected experience when during prehistoric times, I watched some grieving Neanderthals throw bou bouquets of flowers into the graves of their departed. To think I had to contend with the incredulity of your anthropologists when I described this custom. You so-called moderns should stop using the Neanderthal label as an insult when the evidence clearly shows that Neanderthals displayed sensitivities and intelligence equal to your own. It seems like decades, maybe millennia, before my hapless uh, Rainer pratfall, I'm not the only God who loses track of time, that I was drafted by Zeus, AKA Jupiter, to come down here to get things straightened out for you guys. In one of those early efforts, I approached the cap that capricious voyager Ulysses, AKA Odysseus. I had made a special trip out to his ship to appeal to him. Ulysses, I said, stop farting around with Scylla and Charybdis and get yourself home to Penelope. She doesn't know whether you're alive or dead and is just about to give up on you. Go home, Ulysses, go home. And did he listen to me? No, he did not. Unfazed by my Apollonian authority, he had himself tied to the mast so he could listen to those ladies singing off key out on that island. I guess you gotta do what you gotta do. Around the same time, there was Ariadna who, no, sorry, uh, it was Eurydice who died from a snake bite and landed in the underworld. Her boyfriend or Orpheus had asked me to go down there to help him negotiate a deal with Pluto, AKA Hades, who was so charmed by his lyre playing that he agreed to let her go but on one condition. On the way back with Eurydice following us, I was filled with trepidation and felt compelled to remind him, Orpheus, you were warned not to look back. She's right behind us. No need to look back. Please don't look back. Well, we all know what happened to her and him eventually. I have to confess, I still feel a little guilty about her. Would he have turned to look if I'd kept my mouth shut? Then there was that heel, Achilles. I tried to reason with him. Look, man, you've been at this heroics game long enough. Let Hector find someone else to punch in the nose. Take a rest. You've made your mark on the world. Isn't it about time you retired? And give me a break with that Trojan horse, Homer. I didn't believe, I couldn't believe how anyone could be so gullible as to bring that thing into the city. Even after I joined forces with the wailing Cassandra, it was pointless to try to stop them. In every instance, Ulysses, Achilles, Homer, the Trojans, everyone, it was like talking to a wall. Which reminds me, Pay no attention to those un unsubstantiated rumors that I raped Cassandra and was the cause of Daphne's being turned into a tree. 
The truth about Cassandra and me is that we had a brief consensual affair, but then she complained to her mother that I had seduced her with books, that I had made her read all of Proust's Tolstoy and Dostoevsky in rapid succession, which in her eyes was as good as telling her she could order her wedding dress. Needless to say, at that point, I made one of my many hasty e exits. I admit, I've said and done some shameful things in my day, like forcing sex on my muses and allowing two of my suffering cats to live too long before having them euthanized. I could describe many more instances of objectionable behavior, guilt for which has impelled me to return to earth from time to time for a shot at redemption. From my present vantage point, however, and with enduring admiration for Cassandra for her activism during the Trojan War, let me assure you that all in all, I'm not such a bastard as I used to be as you shall see for yourselves soon enough as I proceed. Now that I'm here in what you call the 21st century, I plan to visit all the temples dedicated to me. And beyond that, I also see it as a duty to lay more of that stern advice on you mortals. So last week, I decided to kill two birds with one or two stones, first visiting the temple of Nabu, Apulo in Palmyra, then going on to Damascus for an audience with Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria. Both excursions were disappointing, big time. The temple was a shambles and Assad turned out to be a real scumbag. If anyone needs reasoning with, it's him. I went over there and got my foot in the door. Needless to say, I was very polite. Mr. Assad, I yelled through the partly open door. Mr. Assad, with all due respect, what kind of country do you think you're going to rule when all this is over? The entire population will be either dead or fled. Why, I couldn't even get near the gates of Aleppo. So many refugees were streaming out. Thick as thieves, I refrained from adding. He slammed the door in my face, nearly breaking my foot. The same thing had happened with Agamemnon in Mycenae after I berated him for going to war over a single broad and that idiot King Lear who couldn't see what was in front of his nose. I told William if he couldn't do better than that, I wouldn't show up for his coming out party. And then there was Oedipus. I pleaded with Oedipus not to kill that old guy in the road. I knew if he did, that all hell would break loose, especially after that weirdo in Vienna got so stuck on him. Once again, my entreaties were to no avail. After many centuries of such rebuffs, I was getting pretty demoralized. Mind you, I've approached countless more trouble makers who subsequently disdained my proposals, like that overachiever Charlemagne and your current badasses Duterte, Duterte in the Philippines, Modi in India, and Rump in the United States, for starters. Shameless demagogues flaunting their calculated venalities. Their politics, poli their policies and machinations trap the majority of their citizens in the vast gap between a glossy democratic ideal and a squalid undemocratic reality. As a consequence, your human masses have long stored up feelings of injury, inadequacy and envy and are predisposed to believe in more nonsense than any other species on earth. No rabbit, for instance, would have been willing to crash an airplane into the World Trade Center in the expectation of being rewarded with 72 virgin rabbits in the afterlife. In every instance, my interventions were rejected. And furthermore, and much to my chagrin, I couldn't even begin to pique anyone's interest in the difference between 
transcription, transcendence, and analogy, which in my mind was as momentous an area of research as theories of gra gravity and acceleration, space-time, and Einstein's general theory of relativity. Oy, one failure after another. So I decided to go back to my shrink. I told Dr. Kellerman the whole story. Without missing a beat, he responded, Apollo, you're barking up the wrong tree. How can you expect them to pay attention to you when you're running around down here like a mere mortal or a chicken with its head cut off? Where are your 12 black stallions and golden chariot? Get them out of storage. You've got to make a grand entrance. Only then will they take you seriously. Are you suggesting I should make a spectacle of myself, I asked. Absolutely, he replied. Go for it. I went out of there thinking, this guy is well worth his 200 bucks an hour. I hurried back to Olympus and started to clean up my golden chariot. And what do you know? Obama called. Yes, that Obama, Barack. You've got to come down here. Hillary needs you. He sounded stressed. I'm coming, I'm coming, I assured him. And I quickly finished polishing my golden chariot and hitched up the 12 black stallions. After persuading Calliope and Melpomene to traverse the heavens every day in my absence in a somewhat shabby carriage, the only replacement I could muster at short notice to be drawn by a team of sturdy mules, I set out for Earth. Oi, they ist mir, alas and alack. I had totally forgotten about the pull of Earth's gravitational field. We got burnt to a crisp and I was reduced to a subatomic particle of cosmic dust. Who would listen to me now? It wasn't easy, but I persevered. And after looking in vain for a phone booth, finally got through to Hillary on a borrowed iPhone. I asked her, why don't you fly out to Michigan or Wisconsin and listen to those people? Many of them have legitimate grievances. They can't find jobs and they're sick and tired of being abandoned, betrayed, ignored and condescended to by the likes of you. Granted, some of them may harbor a deep seated racism in addition to their class resentments, but they can't all be neo-Nazis and misogynists. You can't just call them derogatory names. What is it you called them? Rhymes with adorable. For added emphasis, I quoted novelist Edouard Louis, who while discussing the indignities of poverty said in an interview, quote, when you are subjected to endless violence in every situation, in every moment of your life, you end up reproducing it against others in other situations by other means." End quote. Which only partly explains the outcome of the US presidential election in 2016. Long before voters went to the polls, I felt strongly that Hillary needed to be reminded of the loathsomeness of the numbskull she was up against, or as someone, someone called him, a fucking moron, and another, even better, an enigma wrapped inside a whoopee cushion. I did manage to warn her, if you don't reach out and make eye contact, eye contact with those people, before you know it, they'll go for the first loud mouth schmuck that comes down the pike. And guess what she said to me? She said, I don't know what you're talking about. Had she never heard Yiddish before? In spite of her tone deafness, I can't say I disliked her. Under the current circumstances, however, and although it's pretty clear the cards were stacked against her from the get-go, the shenanigans of the Electoral College, for instance, probably sealed her fate, I can't help thinking that it's time for her and her regrettable husband to retreat into the shadows. They've had their day in the limelight and have nothing more to offer. At this point, it would be remiss of me to assert 
that over the eons, we on Olympus have not made comparable and irrevocable mistakes, especially with respect to women, always underestimating them, always blaming them for every evil that ever beset humankind. When Zeus created Pandora, for instance, it did not have to be a foregone conclusion that she would open that box, thus releasing untold miseries upon the world. I saw it coming, but didn't put my foot down strongly enough. I was too di diplomatic. I should have cautioned him. Zeus, are you sure you want to handle her in this manner? I should have suggested that he insert a waiver that would have legally prevented her from opening the box or at least have given her a choice. After all, and in my estimation, things have changed only incrementally. If women aren't invited to the table, they end up on the menu. I've always regretted my timidity regarding the Pandora calamity. So what is to be done? I mean, right here and now on earth, I've had to recoup, re-strategize. William Faulkner said somewhere, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And I would add, sometimes it rises up and grabs you by the throat. On the heels of the Hillary debacle, this does not mean that you should judge the failures of progressives and idealists of the past by the abhorrent acts of the present. Both occur at different moments of struggle. These days, I tell every mortal I meet, no need to set your hair on fire. You're in this together. You are not alone. You are not powerless. Be resilient. You will get through this. Be patient, not reckless. As one journalist wrote, the brick, the bottle, the fist, the fire. Fierce resistance by the oppressed makes for a better story than the drudgery and temporizing of lawmaking and coalition building." End quote. Yes, all the more reason to organize, make alliances, History doesn't always advance, it sometimes stalls, even regresses. Freedom and liberation are an unending task. And to offset my qualified call to arms, allow me to end with a favorite quote from the late Amiri Baraka, quote, what can I say? It is better to have loved and lost than to have put linoleum on your living room floor. Uh, I just want to find here, this is quite a long uh, rant and too long to read in its entirety. Um, maybe it, uh, okay, I'll, I'll read a couple of things from this little pamphlet and then go back and try to see if I can, uh, hmm. Yeah, uh, and this is like a diary. Um, uh, July 15th, 2020, again, in the voice of Apollo, rump is indisputably incoherent and incompetent. Some would say borderline senile. Witness his ramblings at his latest press conference. We quote uh, from Rump. We Them back to our country. We don't want them. They wouldn't take them. Now with us, they take them. Someday I'll tell you why. But they take them and they take them very gladly. They used to bring them out and they wouldn't even let the airplanes land if they brought them back by airplanes. They wouldn't let the buses back into their country. They said, we don't want them, said no. But they entered our country illegally and they're murderers, they're killers in some cases end of that quote. More this time from Biden, quote, he would get rid of wind 
this is more this time about Biden. This is Rump talking about Biden. He would get rid of windows if elected and abolish the suburbs. Let him define the word carbon because he won't be able to. And invoking a familiar theme, unsubtly um, implying that Mr. Biden, oh, that was an end quote and uh, Rump goes on and invoking a film, familiar theme, unsubtly implying that Mr. Biden has grown senile, Rump boasted that he had taken a cognitive test and aced it while insisting that Biden couldn't pass such an exam. And uh, Apollo's comment on this, uh, would it make any more sense to substitute widows for windows? I'm such a technophobe. Could he have been referring to a computer program that I've never heard of? Asked why black Americans were still dying at the hands of law enforcement in this country, Rump said, so are white people, so are white people. What a terrible question to ask. So are white people, more white people, end quote. Jane, a friend of mine I've met on, uh, on earth, told me that that's the way her brother used to talk as he was declining into Alzheimer's, the repetitions, the broken sentences. In a separate interview, Rump falsely claimed that a white couple in St. Louis with guns drawn were on the verge of being attacked by marchers passing their home. And uh, quote uh, from Rump, they were going to beat, be beat up badly and the house was going to be totally ransacked, ransacked and probably burned down, he said, uh, Rump said. Video of the episode showed that the protesters at no point physically threatened the couple. The asshole continues to complain that the rising cases of the coronavirus in the United States are due to in an increase in testing. If we did half the testing, we'd have half the, the cases, he says. Unbelievably illogical in someone with so much power. Replace have with see? No, no, that's not right. These pandemic curtailments of daily life are damaging my brain along with those of everyone else. The longer the asshole is in power and the more he feels threatened, the more we can observe the deterioration of his brain. Meanwhile, the Cretan and his cronies are killing you with their calculated inattention and militarized diversions. His playing down of the pandemic spread and numbers of deaths is tantamount to murder for which among many more crimes, he should be expelled from office and prosecuted. And this well before he exercises his presumed right to do a lot of things that people don't even know about. Those are his words, the right, his presumed right to do a lot of things that people don't even know about. Has any president of the United States ever said anything like that? Uh, July 19th, 2020. Today, I read the New York Times obit for civil rights activist and US Congressman John Lewis, ending with Lewis's own words, and I quote, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble." End quote. I can't agree more. I should take his exhortation back to Olympus as a reminder and rebuke to my dilettantish colleagues. July 23rd, 2020. This is a little convoluted, but I'll try and... Uh, Agnes Collard in today's times uh, in a piece called, Should We Cancel Aristotle? makes a distinction between literal and messaging language. 
What she doesn't take into consideration is the issue of expediency. The message Black Lives Matter, which can so easily be contested by the conservative All Lives Matter, cannot be replaced in a protest demonstration by her extended literal exposition. Banners have to be succinct and economical in length to get their message across while risking oppositional retooling. Though Collard's argument exposes the usual philosophical nitpicking, I found it an interesting read nonetheless. The social urgencies of rebellion in the streets can always be undercut by those in the ivory towers. I would, I would be interested to know if she joined any of the Chicago demonstrators. She is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Chicago. July 25th, 2020, quote of the day, employers are pissed that people won't risk their lives for $8.50 an hour by returning to work and exposing themselves to the coronavirus. Um, and to put an ominous cap on the situation, one scientist warned, this is not a once in a century event. It's a harbinger of things to come, end quote. Believe me, if I could allay this dire prophecy, I would. Oi, once more, I must ask myself, what good am I doing down here? July 31st, 2020, fed up with my US frustrations, I landed in Hong Kong to see if I could be of use to the young activists trying to maintain Hong Kong's autonomy from mainland China just in time to learn that Beijing had passed a new national security law barring pro-democracy candidates from running in upcoming elections. Grounds for disqualification include, quote, advocating Hong Kong's independence or self-determination, soliciting intervention from foreign governments, or vowing to vote indiscriminately against government proposals. End quote. Clearly, as the protesters fear, Beijing is demonstrating a total disregard for the will of the Hong Kongers and fully intends to keep Hong Kong's legislature under its firm grip. I joined the public protests and talked to a lot of people, hoping that some kind of intervention into what seemed like foregone outcomes might be in the offing. The struggles go on. I'll stay here for a while longer. August 1st, 2020. Reading from afar, I am incredulous at the political maneuvering going on in the US. Your self-serving asshole and would-be autocrat is blatantly trying to undermine your mail-in voting procedures, like defunding the post office so that the ballots will not be distributed on time, which will enable him to pursue his main objective of postponing the vote indefinitely. Who is he fooling? One can only hope that when he loses and is in and is out of office, the Dems will go after his taxes and everything else they can get their hands on to put him away. And he knows it. Until then, he embodies a real danger. Meanwhile, I'm meeting some meeting many amazing young people here in Hong Kong, risking their lives for the greater good of their compatriots. I certainly couldn't have shared their courage if I had ever been their age. It took me years to come to my senses and think beyond the pursuit of my self-centered prospects. Unable to change the behavior of my fellow gods in the immediate future, I can at least support the progressive goals of some of you earthling, earthlings when I'm able. August 5th, 2020. When someone recently uttered the old chestnut, pride goeth before a fall, I tossed it aside. It had no relevance to my God-given invulnerability. Well, I've had my comeuppance. I think I've caught COVID-19. 
no fever, but I do have a sore throat and cough. A new wrinkle has penetrated my consciousness. Overstaying my visit on your woeful planet has finally caught up with my Olympian hubris. I'll quarantine myself for the next couple of weeks and try to stay out of YRs, Yvonne Rayner's and everyone else's hair. When I last told Jane about this plan, she said, you'll be thankful for that new invention, the telephone. Who does she think she's kidding? August 9th, 2020, Apollo. Uh, this is from quarantine. An in interesting statistic, 30% of people infected with COVID-19 never develop symptoms. All the more reason to make it mandatory that everyone wear masks and observe six feet of separation. And the fact that annual flu vaccinations do not protect older people is no reason not to get a flu shot every year. August 10th, 2020. I'll keep at it. This is almost over, don't worry. One of my favorite op-ed writers, Charles M. Blow in the New York Times, ends his latest column with, quote, America has a sterling track record of dashing black people's hopes. This conclusion follows a long Jeremiah bewailing the symbolism of much of the protests by Black Lives Matter and their followers. He, like me, must be having a bad day. Uh, I learned a new term today, day AI, short for dangerous anthropogenic interference, which scientist James Hansen uses to describe the increasing carbon dioxide levels in your atmosphere caused by the burning of coal and other fossil fuels, all of which will assure a worldwide climate disaster in the next 20 years. As another scientist has stated, there's enough carbon in the ground to really cook us. Coal is my worst nightmare. That's the end of another quote. When Hansen began his research into this looming calamity over 30 years ago, the poor man thought that just presenting the facts would motivate the politicians to take remedial action. No such luck. That clinches it for me. As soon as I get over this virus thing, I'm out of here. I know it's unfair to lump all earthlings in the same boat while I, I myself will be jumping ship, but I can't help thinking that you humans, especially too many of you white folks in the US are pathetic. My parting shot is the least you can do is listen to your scientists. Best of luck, Apollo Musaghete, AKA, Yvonne Rayner. P.S. Patience. August 13th, 2020. A dream. A theater in France. The audience is streaming in. In the forefront of the stage is a construction with small square shelf units that stretches the width of the proscenium. A woman enters and begins a monologue in French. Soon another woman saunters in and nonchalantly begins to examine some objects on the shelves, like a cup and saucer, a utensil, a vase, etc. The first woman stops speaking, pauses, and says in English, what's bothering you? Woman number two replies, how can we proceed with this play with this construction in the way? First woman, well, let's move it. As they begin to roll it upstage, a large group of children dressed in overalls starts bringing in furniture to create a new set, a large carpet, which they unroll, chairs, a sofa, lamps, end tables, etc. I wake up. Interpretation. With Biden's choice of Kamala Harris for VP is a more hopeful era in the offing. The previous impasse, the obstructive shelving of the rump era, 
is about to make way for a new beginning. You see, I am not such a curmudgeon after all. And just remember, the present does not exist. Whether you like it or not, it is gone in less than the blink of an eye. All the more reason to keep in mind John Lewis's timely advice. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Yvonne, I think that um, we're gonna take a minute and have some questions, but one I wanted to sort of start with, um, if it's okay, is just, and this is Rachel speaking, um, is just to ask you, you know, part of um, why there is this addendum is because the book went to press in the spring and, and Apollo couldn't stop writing in a way, mm -hmm. you kept going. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask what compelled you to, to keep writing this spring and summer rather than perhaps kind of giving in to despair? Um, oh. And also, did you find writing in quarantine different than writing before? Was it, you know, did something change for you? Mm. Um, so I should say that this started almost as soon as uh, Rump uh, uh, became president. Uh, it's a three, at least a three year, uh, uh, enterprise and uh, uh, yeah, and after the pub you published the first volume, I, I I just kept writing, and I figured, well, uh, I'll do it at least until the election. Uh, be I'm obsessed with this man. I, I mean, the New York. I'm a, an obsessive reader of the New York Times, and they are obsessed with this man and. Uh, examining and bewailing every word that comes out of his uh, illiter illiterate, uneducated, insensitive, I could go on and on, mouth. Uh, so uh, Apollo or someone from outer space was a very convenient, um, um, voice for me to inhabit all those years. And it also provided uh, me with a, an escape from my own rage, you might say, being upset all the time, you know? Uh, I poured it into this other persona um, that uh, it was just very useful, uh, someone, yeah, what would someone from uh, what a non-earthling make of what's going on on this planet? Yeah. Uh, the sort of final postscript that you just read um, has the sentence, the present does not exist um, just before you mm. quote John Lewis. And I wondered if you could connect this idea to the image of Paul Clay's Angel of History that you used on the cover oh, of the book. Um, yeah, I should read that. Yeah, um, would you? Yeah. Um, well, uh, somewhere in, in this first volume, um, I, uh, um, Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin, uh, whose essays I have read uh, over the years, uh, I, uh, talks about this uh, Paul Clay image. And I, I should read the introduction. Hold on a minute. Uh, hmm. What page is that on? Oh, here it is. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, um, in the middle of, of this uh, Apollo essay, now that I'm contemplating going home, it has occurred to me that a happy outcome of my latest extended sojourn on your planet is that I can finally allow myself a wee bit of pride in my function in the universe, but not before I quote one more treasure from my beloved and tragic Walter Benjamin a poignant example of one of his lifelong concerns. And uh, 
he interpret. I'm going to read. He interprets this. Uh, can you hold it up? It's mm -hmm. on pa page 54. Yes. Yeah. This is the clay image that he then speaks of. A clay drawing named Angelus Novus shows an angel looking as though he is about to his mouth is open, his wings are spread. This is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the post, the past, where we perceive a chain of events. He turns one single catastrophe that keeps piling ruin upon ruin and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, make whole what has been smashed, but a storm is blowing is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. The storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. Uh, and that last line, the storm of progress, the idea of, of uh, 18th, 19th century progress has been so blown apart by, especially, uh, it's so evident today in, in uh, the uh, re revelations and unveiling of the myths of democracy in this country. And uh, so I, I just felt that image and, and, uh, and uh, Benjamin's interpretation of it was so telling that this angel is backing away from the debris of uh, the messes we have made uh, on our planet. Yeah. Yeah, and, and unable to turn away, right? Sort of trying yeah. to. But... Yeah. Yeah, forced to stare at He's it. He's walking backwards. I mean, that's an ingenious interpretation of this uh, this image. Um, it does sort of connect. I feel like in also in this idea of being the witness, right? Where this you you state again and again that you know the facts and being able to present what's happening should be enough to make us have change. This is Apollo's yeah. kind of yeah. frustration with with Earthlings. Um, and yet that that sort of the time does keep keep going on and on. Um, I, I wonder if um, I mean, I wonder if we can sort of ask you if, if you think tomorrow feels like a like it will be a change or like it'll just be another sort of day in this kind of ever mounting mode. I'm terrified. He's not good. Obviously, he's not going to accept the uh, defeat. You know who I'm talking about, yeah. Um, and what, I mean, he he will, I don't know. I don't know what they, uh, if it goes to the Supreme Court, what this new court will, uh, you know, they will rule in his favor. I just hope it's an avalanche of support for Biden, you know, uh, but, uh, I I feel half the country or almost half is so deluded. I, I can't believe what they say. They, they obviously they don't read the Times. <laughs> um, yeah, Fox News. That's it. And, um, one of the questions that came in. I'm just going to read it um, here. Let's see, if Trump represents half of the US and should, I think half of our people suffered from disagreements while Obama was president, is it a fair game? Are we taking a turn? Is democracy sadistic since the minority of the population needs to follow the majority? Uh, are, are you reading? This something? is, I'm reading, sorry, I'm reading a question that came from the- Oh, oh. From the, so, yes, that, that came oh. from the audience. Oh God, I feel 
it's okay. inadequate to deal with that. Yeah, uh, if 51% of the population votes for Biden, what, uh, what about that 49%? Uh, well, they need re-education, that's all I can say. Um, he can, I, hopefully, if Biden wins, he will do something for the working class and, uh, and especially those who are out of work. And uh, yeah, uh, he will surround himself with progressive people. And uh, I mean, I don't see what uh, Rump has done for these people, you know? They still, uh, uh, they're so disillusioned. Uh, there's been so little uh, economic uh, 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 progress for, for uh, it's all gone to the 1%. So of, of course they, they have no hope for politics to begin with. And then someone who comes around and insults everybody uh, it's very, I can see, it's very tempting, right? Uh, he has no respect for anybody, so let's vote for him, yeah. Um, Yvonne, two questions have come in um, about Apollo and or classical mythology. So the first one is, could you talk about your choice to ventriloquize Apollo as opposed to any other figure you could have voiced? And then I think sort of connected to that is, why is classical mythology, or why has classical mythology specifically mm. proved so good to think with, or such a potent vehicle for your rant? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I have read uh, this at very, uh, a couple of times, and there are people, young people in the audience, who do not know their Greek uh, mythology, you know, and it. it it may be very obscure to them. Uh, I, it was among the first things I was reading when I learned to read for some reason. I, there were books in the house uh, with these myths and uh, I grew up with this stuff. Uh, and uh, to, uh, oh, and also uh, Emily Coates who dances with me her and has become a choreographer in her own right. Uh, and danced with uh, Balanchine. Uh, she's a classically trained ballerina uh, and was in the uh, New York City Ballet for, uh, I don't know, some years. And uh, she, uh, in her, she made a piece in which, uh, which was a collaboration with a, a physicist. She teaches at Yale and uh, hooked up with this uh, physicist who also teaches uh, in the science. And, uh, uh, and in part of this uh, dance, uh, Emily demonstrates a, a classical pirouette that Balanchine made inroads on technically. And, uh, and it's very subtle. While the physicist talks about uh, uh, velocity and, and physical properties that uh, pertain to what she's doing. Uh, it's very interesting. So, uh, and, and, it, uh, and she refers to his dance, uh, Apollo. Um, so she asked me uh, in this piece to play Apollo uh, at uh, uh, the, uh, the church on Second Avenue where she presented this piece. And I come down from the balcony and do a, a, a five minute, I don't know, I was beginning, when she suggested it to me, I thought, oh, that would be a useful persona to inhabit. Uh, I was just beginning to think about writing something. And, uh, and from that point, I took off and I realized how, uh, Ex expedient this persona would be in uh, in, to, in relation to today, today's politics. Um, what was the other part of that uh, question? Uh, and why classical mythology is 
so oh. has pro proven so you know useful to think through these ideas with yeah uh well i think i explained that uh, that it was part of my uh, baggage for better or worse <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> growing up um Ivan, I want to just um, take take another moment to thank you so very, very much for your time tonight. Mm, um, put a pleasure. plug in for the book, which is available from uh, the MIT Press, which distributes it and published by No Place Press. And, also uh, and the book. addendum, which we um, published just two weeks ago um, because because Apollo really couldn't couldn't stop. Um, so yeah. you can go to um, no place press to find out more about that but i just really want to uh give you my sincere sincere gratitude for tonight and for being here with us all virtually <laughs>